Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event. I'm Marty Flax, and I'm the Director of the Human Rights Initiative here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. The Human Rights Initiative works to bring innovative thinking and a multidisciplinary approach to tackle the most pressing global human rights challenges and better integrate human rights across foreign policy priorities. We're jointly hosting this event today with the CSIS Strategic Technologies Program. And I want to welcome and thank Jim Lewis, Senior Vice President and Director of that program for all his help in designing and carrying out this work, as well as his colleague, William Crumpler, who's one of the co-authors of today's report. The topic we're discussing today, the development and deployment of facial recognition technology is certainly one of those pressing human rights challenges. This technology has made headlines over and over again for all the wrong reasons. Police departments arresting the wrong suspect based on false matches, authoritarian regimes and some democratic ones using facial recognition to track dissidents and activists. And a 2019 National Institute of Standards and Technology study that found that a majority of algorithms used in facial recognition technology have higher error rates than trying to identify Asians, African Americans, and American Indians compared to white people. These stories have led many civil society organizations to call for bans on the use of this technology. Last summer, three major US tech companies, IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon, announced they would be pulling back from facial recognition technology in various ways, including not selling to law enforcement agencies. The European Commission has introduced draft rules banning some use of similar technologies, and some local US jurisdictions have banned the use of facial recognition technology altogether. In this context, we're launching two reports here today, which squarely target some of the questions raised by these initiatives. Why is this technology so high risk? And is this risk inevitable? Are there effective steps companies and governments can take to reduce or eliminate human rights risks in the development or deployment of these technologies? And how can civil society most effectively engage actors in this space to push for reforms? To discuss these issues and more, I will introduce one of the authors of the report, Amy Lair. Amy is a non-resident senior associate with the Human Rights Initiative here at CSIS. And she wrote this report along with William in her former role as my predecessor as director of the Human Rights Initiative. Amy previously served as legal advisor to the UN Special Representative on Business and Human Rights and helped develop the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Amy's going to present the key findings of her reports in about 10 minutes or so, after which we have two excellent discussants who will provide their thoughts and reactions and whom I will introduce after Amy speaks, followed by plenty of time for Q&A. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Amy to get us started. Thanks so much, Marty. It's a pleasure to be here and such a pleasure to be on a panel with you as the new director of the program. I'm really excited to see where you take things. I will try to summarize 100 pages of reports uh, in 10 minutes. I'll start off discussing the scope and methodology and then the findings and recommendations from both reports. In terms of scope, we had a global focus. So we conducted interviews with almost 100 people around the globe from, from Argentina to Mexico to Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Kenya, um, a really diverse set of perspectives. I want to give a huge thanks to my co-researcher and co-author, William Crumpler, who was really a thought partner throughout the whole process and was integral to this. Our goal was to create an understanding of how this technology was developed, where the human rights issues lie at each step of the supply chain, and whether and how they can be addressed. We produced two reports. The first report is on the development process itself and the actors that are in it. And then the second report is around the deployment of the technology. And we looked at use cases in both the private and public sectors. And in both reports, we discuss human rights implications and potential safeguards. So what did we find and what did we recommend? Well, we found that the human rights, that the facial recognition supply chain is uh, often quite opaque. There's a range of actors, large and small. And understanding it, at least at a basic level, is really critical to address risk. So although it's complex and different actors play different roles, different times, there's four basic steps. 
one, those who do training data collection. And this is at the beginning of the supply chain, and it's where bias tends to enter the system. Two, algorithm development. So those who build the algorithms based on those data sets. Three, software integration. The incorporation of these trained models into applications and platforms with different use cases. And they sell it to number four, the operators. These are the ones who actually deploy the technology. They can be public or private, and they often have a pretty limited understanding of the, the underlying technology. And uh, that raises its own problems. A wide range of rights can be affected depending on the use case. I'll touch briefly on those. I think privacy and non-discrimination get a lot of attention, particularly issues of bias. But even if we're able to solve the issues of bias eventually, there are other rights at play freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, a whole range of civil and political rights. One example of how the technology is currently used is um, a number of countries that are using it to identify and track protesters. But there are other kind of unanticipated potential impacts. So if right to food, for example, um, if the grocery stores in a particular city were using the same private security contractor, who had a watch list and was using facial recognition, some one-time shoplifter could actually be denied access to all the grocery stores in that city, which would impact that individual's right to food unintentionally. Um, facial recognition also can have positive impact and under the terms of our grant, we looked at both. Um, mobile banking would be an interesting example of that. So if someone is 100 miles from a bank and has never been able to set up a bank account, uh, Identity, identity verification through the technology could enable them to have a bank account for the first time with all sorts of knock-on effects on their opportunities and development. Same for access to social services. Effective remedy is another right that really needs attention in this space, and I'll come back to that. Amy, sorry to interrupt, would you lean sure. forward a little bit? It's a little hard to hear you. Well, that's my headphones, so I don't think leaning forward will help, but um, is that any better? I'll just try yes. to talk more loudly. Okay. That's great, thank you. Um, we looked also just at what some of the human rights tests are um, in terms of what can be learned from international law. And there are tests for government um, that are relevant. Some rights like non-discrimination can't be limited from a human rights perspective. So that raises significant questions about whether you should ever be using one of these systems that has bias baked into it. Uh, other rights like freedom of expression or privacy can be limited, but only under specific circumstances. And the test, although it's for government, I think is interesting for the private sector. So the use has to be lawful. Um, any proposed restrictions have to be provided by law publicly and specifically. The use has to be necessary. I think this is one of the most interesting questions. So it needs to be the only or least intrusive way to achieve the aim being sought. In other words, if a use of facial recognition technology could impact these rights, you need to think about whether there's an alternative first. Is the use proportional and is it legitimate in terms of achieving public aims? So those are the tests. I won't get into them more now, but I, they informed how we thought about recommendations. And some of these recommendations can only be done by government or business. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Some of these could be done by business or government on their own without a regulation, but I think most of them really would require regulation to reach scale, to reflect uh, a public discourse about these new technologies, uh, and to create public confidence if and when they are used. That our recommendations include defining permissible and impermissible uses for both public and private actors. I don't think it's realistic to expect, expect complete self-policing by the private sector. There's just too many opportunities that are lucrative and companies that don't take those will, are not on a level playing field. So we need to create that level playing field. Other questions would be what bias, if any, is permissible? Can facial recognition be used during protests? Should live monitoring by the government ever be permitted? Should it be used at schools for their children? Can they really consent? So that's a set of questions that need to be grappled with and clearly are being grappled with in the EU context. 
Beyond that, every company involved in developing the technology needs to understand what is it buying and a baked in bias or inaccuracy? What is it selling? So it needs to test its own products. And then three, who is it selling to? What are their human rights track records? If they're able to find out what substantial use takes, this is basic human rights due diligence. A key piece to enable this would be standardization. So standardized testing of data sets and algorithms, standardized transparency in terms of how you disclose the results of that, as well as policies and procedures, and independent verification. I think that kind of standardization would really help customers understand what they're buying. Other management systems need to be in place. You can read the reports, things like privacy by design, questions around when meaningful consent needs to be required or alternatives to using facial recognition technology. There are major questions about remedy. Both multiple actors might be responsible for remedy because of the supply chain issues I talked about. Um, government needs to provide remedy as well as the private sector. Uh, and the key to that really as a starting point is just transparency. It's often not known that this technology is being used according to our research. And so people can't possibly complain if they don't know that this affected their rights. Another piece is capacity building. We, we unearthed concerns about operators not really understanding the limitations of the technology. It's often quite inaccurate as a noun when used in real life. By way of example, an independent assessment of the Metropolitan Police found that the results were only verifiably correct 19% of the time when it was being used for live monitoring. And there can be overconfidence in the technology, overconfidence in the machine, let's say. By way of example, one man was held for six days by authorities in Latin America um, based on a facial recognition match. And you have to wonder if the authorities use their normal mental processes to figure out, is this really the right guy? Or if they just relied on technology for that. One last really important kind of point that actually drove why we did this research in the first place is around data sharing. So one concern is that you might put limitations on public sector use of the technology, but actually if there's data sharing between the private and public sector, there would be lots of ways around that. Um, and if you don't have regulation and guidance that all these different actors would be using this technology in publicly available spaces, and that would enable consistent tracking of this data sharing. So that to us is a key piece to be addressed. Last, a couple structural thoughts. Um, noting the law, and this is mostly for government use, law enforcement use is obviously highly controversial, but let's assume at least that there is government agency use of this technology. We've seen examples of independent oversight committees with real expertise at the local and regional level, and we think that could be amplified at the national level. And that kind of oversight is critical. There needs to be judicial oversight of certain uses. And then real expert enforcement and oversight by agencies that are specialized in the same way we see for like the financial sector or other important parts of our economy. I think I'll stop there. There's lots I didn't cover in the report, but uh, I hope you read it. Thanks so much, Amy. Really appreciate it. And we've just put the links to the two reports in the chat on the Zoom, and they are also now up on the CSIS website. So folks are welcome to take a look at those. There's some really great uh, further explanations of how the sector works in there, as well as some really important policy recommendations, some of which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But thanks so much for that great introduction. Um, I want to now turn to, to our discussants. We've got two great speakers who are going to uh, talk about their experience in this sector. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with Grecia Macias. Grecia is a legal officer at R3D, which is a Mexican NGO that's dedicated to the defense and promotion of human rights in the digital environment. Grecia is an experienced litigator, and her work and expertise is focused on freedom of speech online, content moderation, uh, biometric technologies, impact on civil liberties, and algorithmic discrimination. So she knows a little bit about the topic that we're here to discuss today. Um, Grecia, I'd love to get your reactions to the findings in this report um, and talk about how this relates to the work that you do on the ground uh, with R3D in Mexico uh, in, in real time. So over to you, Grecia. Thank you so much. Mari, please let me start with congratulating both Amy and William for this amazing report and this amazing discussion that I'm, I'm, for, I'm sure that it will be like 
great for further uh, academic work. And also, I, I'm, I'm currently litigating two cases regarding facial recognition in Mexico. So when I was reading this report, I was like, oh my God, I have to show the, the judge this, all, all these remarks, because it's really, really, really useful. So like I said, um, I'm actually, well, R3D, we are litigating um, against the use of facial recognition in on the streets, uh, on two states, on um, the state of Coahuila and the state of Aguascalientes right now. And also we're going, to, we're planning to start a litigation against um, uh, a bank that is using facial recognition to, to so a man obligatory of facial recognition, so the users can access to the, to their account. So, uh, so this um, report really is groundbreaking, and it's uh, you, you don't have an idea that how useful it will be for for at least my further work. So, with that said, I also really appreciate. What, it's really interesting that uh, you tackle this. Um, approach from uh, the supply chain process and all the life cycle of the AI, because uh, it's extremely difficult to make um, legislators and the uh, officers in government to understand this. I mean, all the uh, kind of freedom of access of information version of Mexico, when we ask these questions, they're just like, no, we don't know, we don't have any idea what are you talking about. The thing is, the thing is just there. We don't know how it's work. And if the uh, some details. If we tell, oh, oh, we give you that information, it will be uh, a matter of national security or or security and all that stuff. When a lot of the things that we are asking are really uh, basic stuff, like what are your providers, where, uh, what kind of data set did you use, or uh, how are you basics of the development of the algorithm that you don't really have to. Um, go really deep to get that kind of information, no, right? So uh, it's really great, especially because let me tell you a horror story. So uh, about um, recent findings that we have on Mexico's, uh, well, on, on Coahuila's um, facial recognition case. So uh, that it's actually really, really connected with the part, this part and the importance of that, that you develop the part of the training data collection. So the uh, provider of this technology in Coahuila is the uh, Chinese company Dahua. So they sent, they sell, they sold, sorry, my English. <laughs> they sold um, uh, this technology to the Coahuila government. And they say like, oh yeah, it can totally work because, uh, oh, well, don't, 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 don't worry. We're going to make this uh, facial uh, recognition technology work for the Mexican race. I don't know if you know, but there's no Mexican race. I mean, it's such a multicultural, uh, uh, there's a lot of diversity here in Mexico. Uh, um, so I don't know what does uh, the, the Dahua company uh, meant by that, because I'm just thinking that they're going to, they're trying to, their training data collection is going to be really biased because they have like this stereotype of what does a Mexican look like. So starting from that, we have a really, really, really uh, bad grounds for making the the deployment of this kind of technologies, uh, at least on, on Coahuila, uh, the same as on Aguascalientes. So this is really useful because um, when we're talking about these kind of issues, a lot of people have this black box mentality of, well, it's your face, right? How how difficult it could be to identify your face, your face, right? So, so it's really hard for us here in Mexico to make uh, our government understand the impacts and the disparate impacts that that these kind of of, of, of technologies have, especially in vulnerable groups. Um, that's why I really like the approach that you had on, on the right of non-discrimination. And, and it's because it's really useful, this kind of approach to supply, supply chain, because different kind of discrimination can appear in the different stages of the processes. I mean, um, for example, maybe with the training that example that I just gave, or maybe there, there's like um, unknown effects when, uh, we, when at the stage of the algorithmic deployment, right? That can uh, generate a, a disparate impact. Here in Mexico, uh, we have a um, kind of a more friendly uh, way of proving 
uh, discrimination, and we have these all old margins of of international human rights rights law treaties that are um, binding for the Mexican state. So this kind of information are really helpful helpful for us. So we can um, show the Mexican state and the state governors that what they're doing is uh, a violation to human rights. Right? That's on the on the matter of discrimination. Also, I really love. That that you open my eyes with another set of rights that can be um, can be violated. I mean, I have like the the basic no discrimination, freedom of expression, uh, privacy, or, or, uh, due process, and um, freedom of association. But I, I really haven't thought about the freedom of religion. That it also can be uh, um, there. Also, there's grounds for for that right to be violated, or especially what, what you said about um, uh, the children and the protection of the privacy for children, right? So this is, uh, this is uh, sorry, I'm just a, a really late for this work because uh, they, we were looking for this kind of uh, investigation or academia research. So we can show that we're not, um, yeah, uh, creating a problem from from cleaners that is a deeply deeply uh, trouble uh, um, trouble technology that we have to make a lot of adjustment and also it's really useful that you have, you propose like these um, uh, human right impact assessments that are really useful when we're talking about um, these new technologies. I mean, not only in, on the regards of facial recognition or any other surveillance um, technologies. Uh, I know we're talking about the elephant in the room, that the NSO elephant, elephant in the room that are really important, another surveillance mechanism that this is the framework where we can start from, right? Also, I mean, essential, the, this standard of, of uh, necessity, proportionality and um, I forgot the word in, in English, ah, lawfulness. Um, well, here in Mexico, we have a, 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 another um, stage for, like for, for uh, its own I don't know really how to translate that, but, but it's really useful, but it's the same grounds, at least the, 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 the test, the proportionality test, right? So that is also one of the arguments that we are making in courts, right? So this, these technologies not proportionate and we're not the only ones telling this, look at the CSIS report, they're telling the same. So, uh, oh yeah, they're telling me to wrap up. So that's going to be it for me. Sorry to be really excited, but it's really great work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gracie. That was really helpful. And it's great to hear some examples of how this, uh, you know, how this, um, technology is used in real time, but also the challenges that civil society and I imagine companies have engaging policymakers on this and just how difficult this uh, the systems are to understand. And I think uh, we may hear a bit about that from our from our next speaker. So let me turn now to Steve Crown. Steve is the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel of Human Rights at Microsoft Corporation, where his role is contributing to development and interpretation of company-wide policies that support advocacy for rule of law and respect for human rights in the conduct of the company's business around the globe. Um, outside of Microsoft, Steve also serves in leadership positions at the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber, the Global Network Initiative, and the International Bar Association Media Law Committee. Um, Steve, this is an issue that you and Microsoft have spent a lot of time on thinking about and working on in the last few years. Give us your reactions to this report, uh, but also Microsoft's current thinking on this issue. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to start by just saying, I think it's an incredibly powerful report. Really good. I, I end up lecturing across the globe on facial recognition, including how it works. And Jim, I know you have another report that came out in June on exactly that, how does facial recognition work? And getting people to understand the actual mechanics, I think is really important to understanding the kinds of recommendations that are put forward in the report. I endorse absolutely everything you said in that report. I think it's one of the best pieces out there now that um, I'll certainly be using. And what I like most about it, honestly, is the recognition of the responsibility of all of the players in the ecosystem. So it's not just about what data you collect, so, which is an important factor because it goes to those questions of discrimination and ultimately bias in the way that the system works. But it's the way developers need to think about this, 
Um, it's then in the software integrators, it's in the people who deploy it. And just a very simple example is, as you think about that, when you, what images were actually used? And Jim, again, I think you do a great job of describing how images are used and triplets and, and the way we try to develop a template. But as you go through that, the angle of the camera, the lighting that's there, that might be one thing in a training data set. And if you've scraped from the web, it's going to be quite random. If you actually did it professionally with people in, in a controlled environment, you get something else. And now imagine that there's a camera placed somewhere, whether it's in a store or out on a street corner, the lighting is going to be different. The angle is going to be different. The, the mix of interferences, is, we need to know. And that's what the report really calls out as a need for testing. We need in its actual deployed state, how is it working? And related to testing, and that means we need some standardized means of testing so that we can actually compare apples to apples to apples and say, this system has this weakness, this system has this advantage. And maybe one is actually better with its weaknesses than one that's really good in another scenario. But we need transparency. We need to know what is tested. And then we need to be able to compare it. And then we get the benefit of competition in the marketplace to have people criticizing and companies responding. Um, I'll then turn, uh, because my area is human rights, um, it was just touched upon by Gracia, but one of the biggest concerns we have is law enforcement use, and especially the chilling effect on freedom of association. So if you think of, uh, in the United States, we've had the Black Lives Matter sorts of uh, marches over the last year. It's, I'm quite okay with the idea that somebody would uh, take a picture of me or the rest, but the idea that we would have law enforcement or those who um, are concerned about what uh, protesters are doing, capturing all of this and keeping it real time, using it after the fact to determine who did I speak with and where did we go after that? By the way, have we ever been identified previously in the city talking together? All of that, we actually have worked in Washington state. Um, we were uh, major participants in a law that was passed about regulating state use of especially police, uh, but municipal use of facial recognition requiring transparency. And I think it's a natural outgrowth of the sorts of things that are reported in the, uh, the work that you just published. Um, we have, a, in, inside Microsoft, we have an, an office of responsible AI where we have engineering tools. We have gates that engineering processes need to make their way through in order to get better visibility and better controls over the way we're addressing this. Jim, I remember years ago, you and I were in China on a trip and there was a police car and the, the authorities were very pleased with this car that had a camera rotating on top of how they could you know, control a crowd uh, or address a crime so quickly. And of course, we all know the dystopian alternative uses of that sort of technology. I think that's one of the places where we're going to see a lot of public discussion. And I do think this report will be really helpful to inform that in a, in a, really, help, in a really great way. I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions or uh, join in a panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. That was really helpful and really interesting to hear Microsoft thinking about this and the uh, analysis of some of those challenges. Um, so we're gonna turn to some questions. Uh, if participants want to ask a question of the, audience, of the panelists, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your link um, and we will be able to see that. Um, I wanna start with a question for Amy. Um, Amy, the, you know, we've talked a, a few times, we've mentioned about how important it is to understand how the technology works uh, and the report and the other work by CSAS that Steve just mentioned has done a great job at that. But you also took great pains in this report to include a lot of information about how the industry itself is structured, the companies that work in this space and the different types of actors in this space. Can you talk a little bit about why you felt that angle was also important to focus on and what implications do you think the structure of that industry has for both NGOs and for government who are trying to engage with companies on these issues? It's a, it's a good question. You're right. We spend a lot of time thinking about how is this stuff made? Who's involved? How do you make the sausage? Um, and it's partly from my experience. I've worked in business and human rights for a long time. Um, you always want to understand the supply chain and the different actors because I think the tendency is to put all the onus on the end user, but they don't always have the leverage you think that they do, even when they're large companies. And so you want, and we know that some of the, some of the major problems in facial recognition technology happen really early on. And so you need to target each of those actors appropriately. 
and make sure they're all playing their role and they don't get a free pass. And I think we tend to give them a free pass. Um, so wanted to empower NGOs to know where they should be putting pressure in the range of actors actually in play. And then for policymakers too, to make sure that they are targeting all the right entities. Absolutely, that's great. Um, Steve, I wanna come back to you. We referenced earlier that last summer, Microsoft made the decision not to sell this technology to police departments um, until, as you described it, governments adopt human rights-based regulations to govern this technology. Um, how do you see this policy evolving with respect to your work around the world? How will you make determinations about the use, development and use of this technology? Will it be based on individual national laws? And if so, are you seeing progress or where are you seeing progress in governments trying to tackle this as a policy matter? Well, I think, you know, Europe is a great example of the concern that they're now expressing about all biometric uh, uses by authorities. Facial recognition is a subset of that. Um, but the technology is so powerful um, with uh, machine learning and the kinds of um, deep neural networks that we now have. Uh, you know, you can read out there about the ability to um, actually measure somebody's gait. The way you walk is as identifiable as your face with the right data and technologies, that sort of thing. Um, and so we have people looking at this. And then I believe the key thing is to drive more public and international um, discussion, get citizens acti actively involved in the human rights consequences. One of the things I've been working on with uh, many, including the Office of Human Rights in the UN, uh, but in my advocacy, is actually taking that notion of human rights impact assessments that the UNGPs, the UN Guiding Principles, are quite clear about company responsibilities. And how do we find the right analog for that in the way governments think about using these technologies? Literally, should they, uh, because they're, they're making the decisions that set the rules that under rule of law companies uh, are bound by, shouldn't they be discussing what are the trade-offs they're knowingly making and what are the harms and costs that they've decided they will or will not mitigate in what ways? Uh, but really, we're, we're finding that those who have traditionally democratic, strong democratic uh, traditions and uh, concerns about privacy, Europe being a great example, um, are really at the lead of that. And some countries are quite a bit behind, of course. Thanks. So let's let's go back to Gracia and talk a little bit more about the situation in Mexico and maybe more broadly in Latin America. Um, this is, uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of interest from authorities in Mexico, Grecia, about using these types of technologies. I, I noted from media coverage this week that something like 15,000 of the 50,000 names that were allegedly leaked as this potential Pegasus targets are, were in Mexico alone, for example. Um, you know, why do you think that, that your government is so focused on these issues? And do you think that's a similar trend elsewhere in Latin America? And in that context, I, I noticed a question from our audience who's just referencing the fact that in Colombia, um, they are using this as a tool re related to the temporary protection, protected status for Venezuelan migrants, but there's not a lot of clarity or transparency about how that's being used or, or potentially abused. And so can you talk a little bit about the situation in Mexico and maybe more broadly in the region? Yeah, um, Mexico has, uh, uh, well, I, I, will, I mean, I'm from 1996, so when I uh, was growing up in my adolescence and all that stuff, um, I was um, I had to live with the war on drugs that the Felipe Calderón and ex Mexican president started. So I think that was like the starting point for the Mexican government to think, oh, we have to put all our money and all our, and all of our efforts in security. So. Me Mexican government is trying to use this uh, security argument to to justify all this kind of uh, surveillance um, technologies. Sadly, um, we've seen since 2017 that the government has been abusing up, uh, on this technology. The most of the uh, of the well people from the these targets and people that were um, actually uh, spied on by Pegasus, it, were human rights defenders, uh, were journalists, were um, uh, enemies from for, for the state, right? So I think it's, it's, it's um, 
especially Mexico has this culture of surveillance and uh, around this kind of, oh, well, we have to use this technology so we can um, fight with the bad guys, bad guys with especially uh, relating to the cartels and all that stuff, because that's always their answer is how, how we're going to fight the cartels if we are not going to use this kind of, of, of a sophisticated technology, right? So, so yeah, that sadly, um, a lot of people buy this and also a lot of uh, government officials of, uh, are trying to make this argument, but we have uh, proof and we're always talking about the how these uh, technology ha are are going to be abused if we have if we don't have any safeguards. Basically, necessity and proportionality. We're not asking for much. Uh, just um, a lot of specific cases where you're going to use that cases. You have to justify them and um, justify it with this threshold of why are you using it? Is it really necessary? Is it you? Can you use anything else? Because the, you, the government has to understand, and it's really bad at understanding the privacy and civil liberties that are um, that are being violated when using these uh, technologies. So I, I think that is that makes a common also um, uh, factor that uh, happens in another Mexican in other uh, countries and in other uh, countries from Latin America. This kind of, well, we need this for, because security, and you don't kind of understand why they're using that argument because all, all countries have different contexts, but there are a lot of guerrillas, dictaduras, uh, and, all, and, and all these kind of um, really security-based uh, problems that a lot of governments use to justify this. So maybe that's the main reason why we are seeing this in the Latin American context. Thanks, Gracia. It's really interesting. And it's a good uh, segue maybe to broaden the discussion out just a little bit beyond just facial recognition technology and just talk about the, the challenges of engaging on human rights issues in the technology space generally. And I want to stay with you for a minute because I think for civil society, this is a particularly difficult sector to work in. The industry and the work itself is opaque. The technology is constantly changing. Uh, and a high degree of technical understanding is required in order to be able to engage at all. Um, so you work for an organization that is focused specifically on these issues. Can you tell us a bit about what strategies and what resources have proven most effective for R3D in engaging on this issue? And conversely, do you see gaps where civil society's work could be strengthened through more transparency, better resourcing, or more expertise in these areas? First, uh, it's uh, I think the main obstacle that we have is transparency. I mean, one of our main uh, techniques is uh, doing our version of freedom of access, um, uh, freedom of information, uh, like uh, uh, and to ask our government this uh, a variance of, of different things about the technology that they're using, but. Also, not only there is a lack of um, of knowing uh, about the inf the technology that they are using, and, and most of the governments that we talk to, or government officials that we talk to, they're just telling you're telling us like, well, I really don't know how this works, but it works, right? So let's just uh, take it as it is. So this is one of the main obstacles that we have, and one technique also is to try to speak with them and. Uh, build their capacities to so they can understand what kind of technology so we can work together what what kind of technology they're using so we can work together and and like putting the all this the, all the important factors on the table and saying oh well if you do this uh, maybe your intentions are good like okay you're you're worried about security but if you for example in Coahuila that are, that, that they're one of the indicators for uh, deploying uh, more facial recognition cameras on the streets are uh, based on the perception of insecurity on, on the streets, right? So that's like a perfect um, uh, recipe for, for uh, indirect discrimination, right? Because the perception of insecurity are more related with um, poor, uh, poor neighborhoods or, or neighborhoods related with um, um, 
different not on non-white uh, neighborhoods, right? So, okay, so it's like talking about this and talking about this strategy is, I think it's going uh, has been the most more useful with governments. And also the thing that we use a lot is litigation. I mean, if a lot of governments do not understand the kind of problems that they are putting their the citizens on. Uh, unless we are, we start a, a litigation against them. So a lot of these kind of arguments are, we are dealing it at court. We hope we can do it outside of court because it's also a long uh, process and all that stuff. But I think like, yeah, talking with uh, government and also using uh, litigation techniques or strategy have, have been really helpful, helpful for us. Yeah, thank you for that. That's super interesting. Um, I want to turn back to Steve just to keep on this kind of broader focus on tech for a minute, just to um, to think about. I was struck by an interview that I read last week by the founders of NSO Group, who were touting the fact that they, that the fact that they don't know how governments are using their technology or or who's being targeted by their technology is not just preferable in their mind, but actually an integral part of their business model. Um, and in fact many technology companies sort of integrate this sort of firewall, if you will, into their technology, whether that's end-to-end -end encryption or, or AI. And so it leads me to this sort of broader question I want to pose to you about how you see the responsibility of companies to control the technology that they create, um, especially as we move further into AI and technologies that are designed to be autonomous from day-to-day -day human control. How do you and how does Microsoft think about human rights in that kind of context? Uh, great question. And as we move away from facial recognition, um, the, the issues become really challenging in that you, didn't, you use the word control. Um, you know, for decades, we've sold Word and Excel. And, you know, you can write the, the worst possible document. You can have the worst possible use of Excel to invade a, a neighboring peaceful country. Or, you know, you as a student back when you were in college, you can write or communicate whatever you want. Do we really want companies to control what we can do with all these technologies? So it's not a black and white issue. And because it's not black and white, it also means we don't want companies to have any sort of bearing on what happens with their technologies. We believe there is a responsibility as you put out an incredibly powerful technology to also be engaged in how that is used. We actually think in light of these notions, uh, you know, that we do respect the privacy of our end user. We have literally billions of users of our um, services. With that kind of a scale, we think advocacy and we think um, public engagement, um, helping to educate people, and especially collaborating with civil society to um, set expectations, set global norms. And I fully recognize as somebody who spends at least before COVID, spent a lot of time uh, outside the United States, that people approach the questions of privacy or freedom of expression differently around the world. We, we uh, as an American lawyer, I love the First Amendment, but I also recognize that it's a, it's a minuscule uh, fraction of the way most people across the globe think about those challenges. Um, another thing that I'll, I just want to flag is historically, and this is where the collaboration with NGOs is so important in civil society, Historically, the human rights community, we were pretty good at the idea of we were going to deal with mining or supply chain, including labor or sourcing. But the harms there are quite visible and the data is actually fairly accessible. You can take a photograph, you can do an interview, you can record something, and it's really clear the harm that has been occasioned by company behavior. When we start talking about things like uh, misinformation and disinformation, it's a lot harder to get that data. You have narratives you have um, concerns about experiences, but it's really hard to say this is the precise thing that happened and this is the right way or an effective way to address it. So we are much more engaged in the process of trying to find collaborations, both cross industry and especially partnerships with NGOs, everything from partnering with the Office of Human Rights in the UN to all of our work with uh, human rights organizations and civil society across the globe. I don't wanna say that it's, oh, it's so difficult, we can't do anything, or we don't. I, I truly believe we have a responsibility to be engaged and to be helping 
people come up with creative ways of addressing the harms that we can acknowledge, even if we can't prove them in quite the same way. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's really insightful. And, and I want to pick up on uh, some things you've been hinting at throughout, which is what are the policy solutions here? Um, because ultimately, I think a lot of what you all are pointing to is the need for stronger government engagement on this, um, and in many cases, stronger government understanding of the issues in order to effectively regulate. But I want to turn back to Amy to start with to talk about, um, you know, you mentioned in your intro some of the recommendations in this report around uh, how public policy should be reacting to the risks in facial recognition technology. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that in response, if you have any in, in response to Stephen Gracia's comments, but I'm also interested to see here how you see the broader landscape on policy in this area. Where are the biggest gaps in terms of how governments should be approaching human rights in this tech space? And, and where, if anywhere, do you see opportunities to really move the needle on this issue? Uh, it's a huge question, especially like the structural questions are huge and they're going to play out differently in different countries. But I guess I just had some thoughts as I was doing this research that may or may not be useful. And they would apply to facial recognition, but to all of these other emerging technologies that also need management. And I think what we see, I mean, Europe is moving somewhere. And I mean, frankly, whether or not you think the EU draft regulation is perfect, like bravo for them for trying. Uh, which we don't see in other places. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes I think, especially when we started the research, I felt like, oh, everyone in Congress has to understand this technology. It's never going to happen. But what we have done in other complex areas is created regulatory bodies that do have that expertise. If you think about the laws governing the SEC, they're pretty simple. And the SEC, the experts there who actually understand the industry come up with all this guidance about what you're really supposed to do. So like, we need to not have the expectation that the actual lawmakers will have deep understanding. They need just enough understanding to get the basic structures there, in my opinion. Um, and then we need those expert bodies. And I think in a lot of cases, those expert bodies, it's not clear who they are, who has jurisdiction. And then there's a question of, do you only have a centralized body? Do you put experts in each government agency, probably that's the right approach. Um, but there are just basic structural capacity issues that we haven't addressed and I think can move this and make sure that expertise is somewhere in government. Um, I'm not sure if that's the kind of answer you're looking for, but I think it's important. The other piece is norm setting. I don't know that we're going to get to like a global norm on this because there are very regionalized, politicized differences around viewpoints on how this technology is, should permissibly be used. But I do think we're seeing movement in the EU, Canada, right? We just, if we can at least get some global, some partial global regional coalescence, it'll help. It'll help people like Grecia as she's advocating and, and to be really powerful. But we've got to like step up the tempo. Thanks for that. Yes, absolutely. Um, needs to, to build some momentum around the progress we are seeing. We're getting some great questions in from our audience. And so I want to read out a few of them. Um, a couple related to this role of business and, and what are the contours of business engagement and responsibility. And the first one is from um, Charles Bryson. How do non-state actors such as banks, businesses, or stores that, uh, you know, that have shops with surveillance cameras in them, for example, fit into this conversation? Maybe they give the police their surveillance tapes. So the, the companies that are not in the supply chain in terms of the development of the software, um, but they're just someone who, who purchases a camera and then uh, and then turns footage over for someone else to then use it with facial recognition technology. Um, and then a related question, particularly for Steve, um, companies from, from Blaine Headley, um, companies like Amazon and Microsoft have said they won't sell facial recognition to law enforcement without a federal law present. What would that law look like? What specific metrics or principles are companies looking for that would ease concerns and reopen the selling of facial recognition technology. Um, happy to go with anyone who wants to kick this off. Can I pick up the first question? At least give Steve a moment. I mean, I think this point around, so operators basically, people using facial recognition technology in front of their storefront is one we did try to get at in this report because the question there is around data sharing. If we don't have clear rules around data sharing, do you basically enable government agencies to make an end run around the limitations put on them? Um, 
And again, this is just a question of write a law, limit data sharing, and have independent oversight of whether that's happening or not, which is where we've run into problems in the US before. Um, but it just should be addressed. And, and there are, I mean, of course you could just stop the use at all by, you know, in storefronts, that would be the other option. So those are your two options. Either don't let it be used that way in the first place by the private sector or limit the data sharing in a believable way. Yeah, I'll take the second question. Um, it's, it's a really tough one. I, I find myself often uh, in conversations where people say, but there are these conflicts between the rights, the human rights. I don't like the idea of conflict. I think there's a tension. So we have a right to privacy, but we also have a right to public order that, you know, we, we refer to that in the international covenants, the idea of protecting public order. Those are sometimes in tension. Our view on facial recognition and police force, we think it needs uh, several things. One is there should be no mass surveillance and it should not be the idea of or you're just capturing people on the hope or possibility you might find that data useful in the future to the extent it is being used. And there are some scenarios in which it might, you know, there's a, a child who's been kidnapped and you have a photograph of the uh, suspected perpetrator, make up your own hypothetical. We believe those things you should have judicial oversight. So there might be an emergency process by which you can get approval. And then you absolutely have to have transparency. It doesn't do any good to put in place rules if you can't actually enforce them or see that they're being followed. So we're going to have to have things if, if there's a facial recognition technology in a police force and it can be used in the public setting, prohibitions about using it in ways that violate rights to freedom of expression, freedom of religion, using it to discriminate on, on race or any of the other uh, protected characteristics or those that we just determined are inappropriate uh, for us to be looking at. And then it has to have this idea of its use is for a defined purpose, and we actually believe that it will happen. Uh, listen, I, I'm a human rights practitioner. People like the ACLU exist in part because governments regularly fail to live up to the promises that are made. This transparency, this ability actually to have the public involved in making sure it's being used appropriately is an important piece of this. But we as Microsoft, I think generally in the tech industry, we believe the right thing is to use the democratic process and then improve our ability to enforce the rules that we've set and the norms we've established, rather than say, you know, don't use any of it for the potentially useful purposes that could be there. But until we get there, our rule, our statement is that, look, we are not going to be licensing to U.S. police departments till we get a national view using the democratic process to put protections in place. And we do believe those protections have to be meaningful. Thanks. Sorry, I've muted myself. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, Steve. That was really helpful uh, framing and, and something to target in terms of government engagement. Um, we have a few questions that I think uh, I'd love to pose to all of you. One is just a broad one from Moktadir Naim, which is how do you educate uh, people about facial recognition technology that government, Amy spoke to this a little bit a minute ago, um, but also citizens at large that, you know, it's very hard to engage effectively uh, in advocacy or protection, frankly, of your own personal privacy, if you don't really understand the technology and the issues. So what are some strategies to, um, to help educate people about that? Um, Gracia, do you want to start with that one? Um, and I can go yeah. to the house. Yeah, yeah thanks. So um, one of the, uh, of the things that we've used a lot is like, um, well, we for example, for facial recognition in Mexico, we made a site called No Nos Vean La Cara. Then that is kind of a saying of, of don't look at our faces, but it's also like, don't, don't play with us. Don't, uh, we're not, uh, uh, you government, you don't have the right to lie to us on our faces. That's kind. That's kind of a play. Um, so, those those campaigns really help when we're talking about this issue with the broader public. I mean, basics about um, I don't know how, about a video of how does facial recognition works? How can it uh, impact on your civil rights? For example, uh, uh, in Mexico City, where there is a lot of protests going around, especially for uh, feminist and. Um, feminist and uh, um, also for the, the mothers of, of people who have this fear. We center on those kids like uh, 
do you really want the government to capture your faces and maybe be uh, put on, on the risk that of getting detained for, for uh, any suspicion that they have, right? So even we have, we are working on a toolkit like uh, mask or especially like a makeup tutorial against uh, facial recognition or kind of that stuff that make people engage and do a, a lot of more, get more involved with, 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 with these cases. I mean, those kind of, of things are really helpful. So, so people can understand, well, yes, it's not just about security. It's about my privacy. It's about non-discrimination. It's about my freedom to protest. And that they're not all this kind, especially the messages, these kind of technologies can be used against me and the ones that I love and, and I can my community, not necessarily, not necessarily against the criminals. So that's a great way to talk with broader public. Thanks so much, Gracia. So we're down to just a few minutes. I'm going to let Steve and Amy give uh, each a last word on this or anything else they might want to add, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, I know we started on facial recognition, but this idea of machine learning and what is happening with neural networks, it is, as you just noted, a matter we need the public to understand more. So loan decisions can be made based upon deep analysis of what is the risk. And the key question is going to be, what is the data that's being input? And then actually a machine might infer it with enough data, it might determine, oh, there's a, I can determine from this, that this person's in this zip code and I can determine from this zip code, what the racial composition of that community is. And all of a sudden things that they never intended to discriminate on can weave their way back in. That's why this idea of testing and reporting and transparency is so important. I actually think one of the things we need is not just reports like this one, which again, I, I love the reports that CSIS just put out, but actually getting those consumable by the public. Maybe we need you know, animated videos or something, and then you can have the deeper dive. And if you wanna learn more, go to here. And maybe we need some staged learning opportunities till you get something at the level of this report or even deeper. We have a lot of tools that we put on the, um, on the web, uh, Fair Learn and other things on how machine learning and and the tools we have actually to interrogate what a black box machine actually is prioritizing, where are weights actually being accorded. We need more visibility to that and more people engaged in that process. But we won't solve it just by companies sitting down saying we know the answer. That's pretty clear. Thanks, Steve. That's great. Amy, one last word over to you. Well, this gives me the opportunity to talk about like my pet dream project, which is like creating games that people would actually want to play for fun that explain these kinds of systems and some of the risks and opportunities. I think that like it's a way of engaging people because they actually just want to play the game and then it causes them to think other media opportunities as well, right? I just think, I think it's a great report. I don't know that my mom wants to read it. Um, and so we've got to find much more creative. I mean, as a lawyer, I don't have the right skill sets necessarily. We need creative people to help us do this. And that's where I think actually there are a lot of links that can be built and also that funders should be thinking about. All right. Well, that's a great segue to Jim because he's a very creative person. So I'm going to turn it over to him for a few concluding remarks. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Marty. Thanks, Amy. And thanks to everyone. Good seeing you all. Um, just a couple quick concluding remarks. First, listening to this, the parallels to the debate we've had earlier on communication surveillance are really interesting. And so some of the same issues, access to data, privacy, uh, warrant, government oversight. Uh, and that makes me think in some ways, this is a problem that the, the digital technologies we've seen for the last 25 years have unavoidably created. Uh, we're seeing an expansion. I call it public domain sometimes. But what's public domain? What's private? What's personal? Uh, we are having to rethink those boundaries because of the changes that technology has created. And so when you think about uh, Brandeis and Warren uh, 130 years ago being upset that photographers were taking pictures uh, with old cameras, um, the world has changed so much since, since then in the ability to collect data. And so um, we will need to rethink what we do. China came up a lot, and I think China is, you know, one of my rules of thumb used to be that if China does it, it's probably a bad idea. That's not always true. I point you to central bank digital currency where they're doing quite well. But 
the issue behind China is trust. And that's the same as communication surveillance. So one of the things that we have to deal with is the decline in trust in elected governments. How, how do you rebuild that? Um, a couple, a few people brought up the need for understanding uh, the technology. And I will say that some of the early research on it, I'm not touting our own work, but some of the early research was flawed by confusion over different technologies. So if we can help fix that, that would be good. But um, the research isn't going to stop. So to the points that Marty, Amy, Steve, Gracia have all made, we are going to need to develop the guidelines and rules that will govern use, that will protect the public space, protect the private space uh, for this technology. And so uh, thanks for attending. Great report. Congratulations, Marty. Thanks, Amy. Thanks so much, Jim. And thank you, Amy and William, for a great report. And Steve and Gracia for being with us today. And thank you all for joining. Enjoy reading the report and have a great day.